Pop culture has met the microchip, and a strange new creature has emerged. You've got this convergence of youth culture, technology culture, dance culture, and to an extent drug culture as well, which has become merging in the middle. At the heart of this techno trip is a drug called ecstasy. For thousands of years, people have been banging the tribal drum and dancing for 12 hours, and often drugs were involved. Instead of like having a few natural herbs that have been shot up your nostril with a blowpipe, um, you're getting sort of pharmaceutical things, and instead of the sort of skin over a log for a drum, you're getting electrical sounds. But the pleasures of rave have their price. Ecstasy can kill. Your blood clotting goes haywire, your brain begins to dysfunction, and your heart can pack up. But despite dangers known and unknown, this heady mixture of music, drugs, and technology has created a brand new experience. Club culture for the last 10 years or so has represented a kind of center of energy, and it's either get with it or, or drown, really, surf or die. It all began in 1988, the so-called second summer of love. Late at night, cars full of revelers packed normally deserted motorways. They gathered at service stations and waited for a tip-off. The location of an open field or a disused warehouse. It was all kept last minute to prevent the authorities from getting there first. The police thought they might breach the peace. The kids said they just wanted to dance to a new music called Acid House. But there was one other crucial element. The new dance music arrived at the same time as a new drug called ecstasy. Ravers who took the drug enthusiastically reported that it made them feel warm, friendly to strangers, and want to dance all night. Ecstasy is a class A drug, which means dealing carries a maximum life sentence. But tens of thousands of doses made mainly in illegal Dutch factories are taken every week, and it's thought at least two million Britons have tried it. How does ecstasy work? What does it do in the brain? Thinking and feeling are the consequences of frantic electrochemical activity in the 10 billion or more neurons or brain cells that cram our skulls. Ecstasy works mainly on one group of neurons, the serotonin system. The center of these cells, their nuclei, are clustered at the base of our brains. From here, long wire-like tendrils or axons spread throughout the brain. These are real axons seen under a microscope. Something similar to an electric current passes down the length of these axons. When it reaches the end, it releases a chemical called a neurotransmitter. This substance jumps from one neuron to the next. They are the brain's internal messengers. And it is these that many psychoactive drugs affect. The ecstasy molecule, because of its shape, forces neurons to spew out large quantities of one particular neurotransmitter, serotonin, or as it's sometimes called, 5-HT. If you imagine my arm as being a nerve terminal, when this becomes electrically active, it releases 5-HT. And um, the way, what it then does is to suck all the 5-HT up again. So it sort of dunks it into the, this, this cleft, this gap between the terminal and the next cell in the chain, and then sucks it all back up again by a kind of vacuum cleaner action. What MDMA seems to do is to reverse that sucking up process and to squirt out 5-HT from the nerve terminal. It's like connecting the hoovering pipe to the wrong end of the hoovering machine. It's squirting out rather than sucking up 5-HT. In depressed and aggressive people, serotonin release tends to be low. Conversely, when ecstasy forces out large amounts, it seems to cause euphoria in normal people. But many of ecstasy's effects are unknown, and with so many people taking it, scientists at the University of San Diego are urgently trying to understand it better. They have compared the effects of ecstasy and a well-known stimulant, speed, on rats. This box is crisscrossed with invisible infrared beams. Every movement and gesture of the rat is recorded on a computer.
Undrugged animals are very curious. They rear up and explore the box, and being burrowing creatures, they investigate holes with great interest. A computer charts an undrugged rat's movements over 15 minutes. Another rat is injected with speed. Ten minutes later, the drug takes effect. The animal becomes far more active. It does what it was doing earlier, but only more so. This was the undrugged rat. Now, 15 minutes of a rat on speed. Ecstasy, like speed, also produces hyperactivity, but of a repetitive kind. These rats stop rearing and looking into holes. They seem stripped of all curiosity. The computer shows the effect of the drug. When you look at the patterns, these patterns are vastly different. In the MDMA-treated animal, they keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's just a very, very almost stereotype pattern of uh, repeatedly hugging the wall and repeatedly rotating. Scientists have recently begun to speculate why ecstasy does this. As the drug forces the release of serotonin molecules, they go to several possible landing sites or receptors. Each of these affects behavior differently. Stimulating one of them, the 1B receptor seems to encourage repetitive behavior. Although ecstasy stimulates all the receptors, the effect of this one seems to dominate. In this way, Ecstasy may have found the part of the brain that makes you want to dance. One basis of the ray phenomenon is the music, is um, sort of synchronizing people's behavior to an underlying rhythm. When you move to that rhythm, you essentially do a one type of behavior. The demands on your behavior is to do the same thing over and over again. You're taking a drug, that uh, does the same thing over and over again, and it seems to fit perfectly together. Some people listen to it as boring, but you're getting such, such intense pleasure from just dancing that it just, I mean, everything else would just be second best. You sort of lose track, and the rhythm is very important in, in enabling you to lose track because it's something that sort of moves your body. It's not something that you have to concentrate on. You have to click into it and get into the groove of the pattern and relax with it. And that is it's an incredible feeling. It may be an incredible feeling, but the pleasures of ecstasy are not without their price. This drug can kill. The pleasures of rave have their price. Ecstasy can be very dangerous. It's been found mixed with chalk dust and adulterated with other drugs like speed and LSD. And there are features of the way young people are using this particular drug which are very dangerous. Uh, young people often take it uh, with no uh, information education as to what the effects are and what they should or should not do and I'm concerned that young people often being impulsive uh, may get themselves into a lot of trouble. Even when completely pure, ecstasy has dramatic effects on normal metabolism. It switches off the body's early warning systems and after hours of vigorous exercise there can be severe overheating. Around 25 die every year. These people's body temperatures were almost at the region of no return. They need urgent treatment to cool them down, mainly to fill them up with fluids and enable the body to start sweating again. If they aren't treated quickly, well then two or three things can go wrong. The heart may stop pumping properly, the brain can pack up, and perhaps worst of all and most dramatic of all, the blood stops clotting and they can bleed from anywhere. But even more disturbing, 
there may be long-term dangers which will affect every ecstasy user. This freezer is full of thin slices of squirrel monkey's brain. Dr. George Requate at the John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore has uncovered alarming evidence that ecstasy destroys brain cells. This is the normal distribution of serotonin axons in the brain of a squirrel monkey. This is an animal that was exposed to MDMA a year and a half previously. And you see that there's a marked reduction in the number of serotonin immunoreactive axons in the cortex. And again, this effect or this loss of serotonin immunoreactive axons is evident not only in somatosensory cortex but in a number of other regions of the forebrain of the squirrel monkey. The data we have thus far suggest that MDMA is a highly, highly neurotoxic substance that if taken even in just slightly higher amounts than the normal dose could result in this kind of brain injury. In his study, Dr. Requate gave the squirrel monkeys the equivalent of just three average street tablets of ecstasy. Whereas alcohol produces its neurotoxic effects after very high repeated doses, MDMA has the potential for producing neurotoxic effects, at least in animals, after a single moderate dose. Okay, um, well let me tell you a little bit about the uh, lumbar puncture or the so-called spinal tap that you'll be... We can't examine our own serotonin systems directly, so Dr. Requate measured levels of a serotonin byproduct called 5-HIA in the spinal fluid of people who were regular ecstasy users. He found that their 5-HIA levels were 30% lower than normal powerful evidence that ecstasy damages serotonin axons in the human brain. But are there long-term effects on behavior and mood? Dr. Requate's study subjects underwent a battery of tests. Serotonin damage should show up as changes in levels of hostility. It did, but not quite as expected. We might have predicted, indeed would have predicted, that lower serotonin would result in more impulsiveness and more hostility. But in fact, what we found is that people with a history of MDMA exposure, in whom we find low serotonin metabolism, they report less impulsivity and less hostility. So that, the direction of the change was also surprising. Many years later, do you feel a more kind of relaxed and less aggressive kind of person? Definitely, definitely. Because before I'd like, I would like take things so personal or I'd be more stressed out about everything. And now I think I can just take it a little bit more as it, as it is and how it comes. So mm. I think it has helped you kind of like calm your life down, you know. What we don't know is what will happen to people as they age. We do know that there are changes in serotonin systems over time, i.e. with aging. And one of the concerns is that if an individual doesn't have the usual amount of backup systems, if you will, because of prior MDMA injury, that if they lack that reserve, aging with age, they may begin experiencing problems and difficulties that they otherwise would not have been uh, subject to. However good ecstasy makes you feel, it is dangerous. It has killed. But how necessary is it? Can people listen to pounding, repetitive music without any drugs and still be ecstatic? If there is more to the experience than drugs, what is it?